All right, folks. Um, I just finished this video. And uh, I had three cameras running for the welding of the assemblies that you're about to see. Their intermediate camera stopped recording. No! I really wanted this to be perfect. <laughs> um, I actually refilmed all of the original footage of me uh, doing the layout work before cut yesterday. I was holding my parts too far away and they were half off the camera. So I came in here this morning, refilmed the entire thing from scratch. <laughs> that having been said, this video is about angle bars, okay? It's about how to fit them together, different methods of joining uh, structural angle bars. And I did all the welding with flux core, um, just because it was here, it's on the machine right next to me. Um, if it had been set up for MIG, I'd have done it with MIG. Um, could have done it with anything. Um, but the fact is, is I want you to see some different methods of joining angle bar. And this is really for your own uh, personal builds. Uh, this is not intended as a, a, a way of Jamie Carter saying, you know, this is better than what's on the engineering drawing, right? If you get a blueprint and you follow the print, um, someone did a lot of work uh, to calculate those joints. And uh, there's been years and years and decades of research done on, on what works and what doesn't. What I'm giving you are different methods of joining the materials. A lot of it is shipyard driven. It's what I've seen at BNW. Um, but some of it, it really is just, uh, you know, if you're building something for yourself uh, and you're making it up as you go along, we'll, we'll hope that, you know, you're, uh, you're, you're doing the overkill thing. Um, but it gives you some options of how to make angle bar connect together. The methods for angles could easily be adapted to uh, any other structural shape. But the basic idea is to have enough weld on the joint that the weld strength is equal to the parts strength. Right? We don't want to join something together and have the weld less strong than the angle bar or structural shape was in the first place, okay? So, with that having been said, let's get started. Eventually, you're gonna to need to lengthen a piece of angle bar. Um, I think it's really important that you uh, do so maintaining the original strength of the material. And I've got two different setups here. Uh, the first, which is probably the more common, is to bevel the angles. Um, I simply took a grinder and uh, I beveled these. I'm going to pop this off so we can get a view of it. But essentially the bevel goes all the way into the corner. Um, if you have a brand new grinding disc or a, a new flat disc, um, I have one right here that's relatively new. The corner is sharp enough that it will actually, you know, uh, get into the corner of the angle bar. Um, but if not, then you may have to grab another tool like a cutoff wheel to, you know, kind of take out that last little bit to get into the corner. Um, I think it's important to bevel these all the way. And I also prefer, if you haven't noticed already, to bevel them from the inside. Um, my preference to beveling them on the inside is simple. Um, if I bevel them on the inside and I weld the joint, uh, like is shown here, then the part I have to V out is open, it's accessible, it's easy. I can get a grinder all the way across. If I bevel them the other way, I would have to somehow get a grinder in here and into the corner, which means a conventional grinder, uh, four and a half inch disc or thereabouts, is just simply not gonna work. So you can fit these up with a slight root opening or tight, it's really your preference. Um, if I bevel them all the way to a knife edge, as I have done here, I will generally fit these relatively tight. And I'm simply going to use a couple of clamps, uh, C-clamps in this case, vice grips, almost anything will work. In fact, you could put these in a vise and probably uh, it would do it. But I'm going to put a couple of clamps on and that will hold them in alignment until we get ready to actually weld. Now I, I had a, a good flat table, so I didn't need another clamp on the back side. But if you don't have a flat working surface, you may need two uh, angles on here to ensure your alignment. The other one 
is a little bit different. This is, this is fit up with a square butt. Now, both of these angles are the same. They're three by three by quarter inch thick. Um, I don't have any personal issues with welding these as a square butt, provided the root opening is uh, sufficient. I would say the minimum root opening uh, is gonna be the thickness of the plate um, at the shipyard uh, for regular welding. Uh, 3 16 of an inch is the thickest that they do square butts on. Anything over 3 16 uh, has a root opening. But for working uh, alone, working at your house, doing fab work, as long as you weld the inside of this and then grind the back side to ensure full penetration weld, you're probably okay. If you want to put a slight bevel on this, leave a, a land or a root face at the bottom, maybe half the thickness of the material, that will work as well. <clears throat> now what I have here is I have a piece of ceramic. This is ceramic tape. Uh, here's a piece that's uh, not been uh, used yet. They come in two foot lengths. Uh, it's fairly expensive, but it's worth its weight in gold. This particular ceramic has ribs on the inside. Uh, the tape itself is just aluminum, um, high heat tape. Uh, you can see from the uh, back side that the back of the ceramic is actually flat. So you would generally use ceramic with the ribs for any process that has a slagging system. That gives the slag some place to go and uh, allows you to still get reinforcement on the back side. If you are welding this with MIG or pulse arc or any other form of solid wire, even aluminum, um, you would want ceramic that is placed on the tape the other way around so the flat side is facing up. Um, it would still work, but you'd have excess reinforcement. Uh, the ribs actually hold the ceramic away and you would end up with more reinforcement than you want. All right, in this next section, we're gonna talk about just uh, regular 90 degree joins. In this case, I'm going to join the angles together from the uh, outside of the angle bar. Um, we'll discuss joining them the other way uh, a little bit later on. But the outside join is pretty straightforward. These have already been tacked together, as you can see. Uh, I'm going to start off with a couple pieces of angle. Again, they're either going to go together like this. Of course, they could be in the middle, I suppose. Um, the other way around, it doesn't make any difference, the technique, the fit up is all exactly the same. In this case, I've actually gone ahead and I've beveled this top edge. Now I've left it tight. Um, you could bevel this, uh, cut this back a little bit, leave a little bit of a root opening and save yourself some trouble in the next step. But essentially what you're looking to do is to get enough weld all the way around this part that the weld throat thickness, okay, the actual cross-sectional area of the weld is equivalent to the cross-sectional area of the material. Um, if it is, you're, as a general rule, you're gonna have 100% uh, full strength. These joints will be what we call 100% efficient. Um, if I were to weld the outside in here and in here, and then just put a ceiling pass across the top, uh, I could end up with a situation where uh, that gap inside of here is, is uh, not filled uh, really very deeply at all. And if this part is stressed so that it flexes like this up and down, uh, that could actually crack through uh, from the inside. Um, now, if you've got a lot of penetration, that may not be an issue. Um, but what we're gonna do in the video is we're gonna show you how to make this 100% full penetration well. <laughs> what we wanna talk about now is how to join these two angle bars, not this way, but the other way. Okay, if these angles had to be joined uh, in this direction, whether it's you know this orientation or this orientation is irrelevant, um, somehow we have to cut away enough material out here to get this part all the way back into there. What I have to essentially do is I have to remove material from the top face so that that can come in. And I need to measure the distance from the inside of the angle to the outside. I know this is a three inch angle and I know this is quarter inch thick. So if I subtract one from the other, I end up with two and three quarters. If you're not good at math or you're not exactly sure what the thickness is of the angle bar that you're working with because you're making something at home and uh, you're just using the material that's available, um, the method of determining that measurement is as simple as taking a combination square, placing it square against the face of the angle and then carefully sliding this down until it touches. 
but essentially that measurement is going to be transferred to the other angle bar. So if I take this angle here and I transfer this measurement over, again that distance, hopefully you can see this from here to here, has to come off this front face. So I'm simply going to place it on and I'm going to make a mark with a soapstone. Then I can turn my square. I'm going to lengthen this out a little bit. And I can mark that piece all the way across. Third hand would come in really helpful right about now. So this portion right here has to be removed. And it has to be removed down into here, through at a minimum the thickness of the material. Now this is quarter inch thick uh, bar. You could simply set a mark at quarter inch. Again, if you don't know how to read a tape measure, just use it as a comparative tool. Uh, lock this on. And then mark this from the outside. I'll use this to hold the part up to give me a little a bit of an assist. And by simply marking this top edge, if I can get this to slide, now I can extend this line down through and this portion will ultimately be removed as well. There is a radius inside all angles, so that sharp corner that's remaining will bump into it. So the last step is to remove it. And again, I'm just going to make a slight mark. So everything that's scribbled in white on this is going to be removed. And I'll go ahead and cut these in the cut portion, and then we'll come back and we'll weld them. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to join the angles at an angle other than 90 degrees. Um, essentially, if we wanted to join them on the outside, I would simply cut my part at that angle. So if I took this piece, cut this off, it would simply butt up against it, and I would weld all the way around as we did in the first video. If it needs to go on the inside, the process is going to be a little bit more complicated. And I'm going to set this just like this. Um, the actual cut is uh, not as easy to see. Now there's two methods of, of doing this. The first method is what I'm going to call kind of a cheat method. And that is to simply uh, overlap the parts and scribe in the cut. Um, that's actually a really good way to go. Right now I can do that. I have angle pieces that are 8 inches long, they're on the bench, they're easy to work with. But what if this had to fit something that you couldn't simply manhandle? What if you had to fit something that was on uh, something that was in service and you had to cut the parts? Um, I'm going to show you how to do that next. But for right now let's assume you can cheat this in. There's a first step we have to take in order to get this accurate. Um, as you can see, this corner is sharp and I have a radius on the inside. If I bring these pieces together and I hold this tight at the top, I will end up with a gap in here because the corner is hitting the radius. So the first step is to grind away that corner. Now, I've already done that ahead of time, so I don't have to do any more grinding on the video. Um, I've got the corner ground away right here. And by doing that, I can now get this to fit tight. I can get no gap here, and I can get no gap here, and ultimately that's what I want. So I'm going to set these pieces uh, on one on top of the other. I'm going to grab a vice grip clamp. Uh, hopefully this is uh, adjusted somewhere in the neighborhood. It looks like it is. I'm going to loosen it just a whisker. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to set this at a specific angle. I'm not just going to fit this random because I'm going to do two parts. Uh, for you in this clip. One we're going to scribe in, the other part we're actually going to calculate what the measurement would be um, using simple tools. So I want to make sure that I'm setting an angle that I'm going to duplicate. <clears throat> the angle I'm going to set is 35 degrees. Um, hey, I got lucky. 35.0. That's pretty rare. So I'm going to line this at 35 degrees. Now I'm going to do that by laying this on top and I'm simply going to spread this outside edge until this is parallel to this. Um, I don't have a lot of room on the inside corner to fit this large tool. Actually, I'm going to close it. And that right there is 35 degrees. 
Again, I'm lined up here. I'm using my eye. I know the camera's slightly misaligned, but I'm gonna use my eye to line this edge up with the bottom edge. I can verify that now by placing it inside the corner. And again, it's a tight fit. I prefer this method because there's not a lot of room here uh, to get a precise alignment. But basically, there's my 35 degree angle. I'm gonna set that off to the side. Once I know I have my angle correct, and I'm gonna hold this tightly, the clamp is not really tight. But for the camera, I wanna flip this up to make sure there's no gaps on the inside, everything's tight. Again, I've removed the corner so I can get a tight fit. I'm going to very carefully scribe this outside edge. Now this outside edge will be the cut line for a no gap fit, all right? Um, it's important that you recognize that you might want a gap, so when you do the cutting operation, you may wanna take the white line to create a slight gap to make this butt well that will be here eventually uh, easier to get to full penetration. But for right now, we're just simply gonna scribe that piece in. I'm gonna remove the clamp, set this piece off to the side, and now, just like before, we have to remove the entire top portion, so I'm gonna scribble this in so it shows up a little bit better on the camera, show off my amazing world-class coloring skills. Don't be jealous, practice a lot. And again, we're gonna come in here, we're gonna remove that quarter inch thickness. My combination square is still set to a quarter inch. So again, I'm gonna prop this up because I don't have a helper with me. And I'm gonna do this with my opposite hand this time and try to just simply slide this down. Um, in all reality, folks, um, the cut line that you're making here, you probably could approximate it. In fact, I've got a line, but I'm just gonna go back over it by resting my fingertip, getting this soapstone out where I think it's a quarter inch and simply making a cut line. Um, I'm gonna extend this down through right here, and then I will remove this portion as well. Now I've ground the corner, so I've got a slight uh, bevel there, but again, I'm gonna make sure that I remove a little bit so that these will in fact go uh, corner to corner without an interruption. But ultimately, that piece will slide in here. Uh, it won't go under, it'll be lined right up, and uh, we'll have a nice tight fit. What I basically have is I have a part that needs a cut line across here, just like we did before. But I need to determine where that cut line is. Now, when we overlap the parts, we determine where the cut line was by grinding away the corner of the plate to get a tight internal fit, and then we simply scribed it. Well, if I can't do that, in service, okay, or if the parts are just too big to handle, I have to measure that. Step one, we need to actually create a line from this corner, again, represented here, that is perpendicular to this angle bar. So in order to do that, I'm gonna go back to my original measuring tool. I'm gonna add 90 degrees to this measurement. So we're at 35 degrees, that's the angle that we want between the plates. I'm gonna add 90, so 90 and 35 is 125 degrees. Again, if you didn't have a digital uh, tool, this was 15 bucks at the local hardware store, folks. Um, this actually came from Rocky's True Value in Bath, Maine. Uh, it's an Ace True Value. I would imagine any Ace True Value uh, store throughout the country would carry these, and it's worth its weight in gold. So I'm just gonna swing this around uh, to 125 degrees. Now that is 90 degrees more than what we had. I'm then gonna take that and I'm gonna put it on the outside of the angle bar and I'm gonna line it up with the corner. That corner is the corner that is represented in black right here uh, and we're making the line that is represented with the soapstone line. So with that lined up, I'm gonna take my soapstone and I'm gonna draw in my reference mark. So what I have now is I have that line. 
That line that I drew originally, just for reference, again, I don't need to do this portion at all to make the cut. I'm doing it just visually for you folks. That line is this line, okay? So you see where that's coming from? Okay. <clears throat> what I need to do now is I need to measure from the inside to the outside along that line. I know the angle bar is three inches. I know the material thickness is a quarter inch, and I know that the distance that's left over is two and three quarters. So I can set this to two and three quarters of an inch. Um, but essentially, you can just compare the two measurements uh, simply by doing this. And uh, if I do that, I may find that because of the little roll that's on here, it's slightly different. So it's not a bad idea to use this as a comparative gauge anyway. So there we go. So I need to measure along this line that much. And I'm going to make sure that this is touching on the shoulder here. I don't want the corner to be uh, you know, up in this region on the bottom where it's not going to actually help me. But I'm going to make sure it's touching in the corner. I'm simply going to hold it. And then I'm going to transfer my soapstone mark over here. Okay. Now I can go back to my original 35 degree angle, measure it off of this side, and I can transfer this line over, okay? So I'm gonna reset this, again, back to 35 degrees. So there's my original 35 degrees right there. Now that angle was measured uh, as an inside angle, something like this, you know, uh, kind of crudely, right? That's obviously not gonna help us, but if we flip this over, now we can line that tool up through the soapstone mark. And I'll simply slide this down until it hits the mark. Hold it carefully, and then draw that cut line in. Okay, so there is the portion that we need to remove. And again, I'll color this in so it sticks out better on the camera. Uh, sometimes, if you're dealing with parts that are complicated or maybe they're out of position and uh, it's easy to kind of get yourself turned around, it might be uh, worthwhile just to color them in anyway. For the purposes of this cut, I'm just going to eyeball that quarter inch. Um, I've done this several times before and my cut is inevitably not going to be perfect depending on what method I use, oxy fuel, torch, saw, hacksaw, whatever. And I'm going to mark my little corner that I have to remove. So that is how you lay this out using measuring tools. Okay? If we take this and compare it to the original part, let me reach way over here. Again, this is the original part with the corner cut off. You'll find that the layout is the same. Okay, It's the same basic layout. And that, folks, is how you do that. All right, the last method of joining that I'm going to show you, um, I'm doing so with hesitation because I really hate it. Um, but the fact is, is that there are some applications where um, it's, it's the way to go. That method is the 45 degree cuts uh, or a picture frame joining. Uh, the layout is pretty simple. I could have just cut these at 45 degrees and then joined them uh, without doing any layout work at all. The horizontal bandsaw would do a better job of that. But if we had to have a part that was uh, uh, you know, cut to a, a predetermined length, uh, maybe we needed a, a frame that was you know, say four foot by four foot, and uh, we didn't have the ability to make you know, angled cuts on a miter saw, we may start off with uh, a straight length that is the correct overall length, and then we have to join them up uh, picture frame style. The picture frame uh, joining method is as simple as envisioning the parts going together. In this case, they would come together like this, obviously not with the overlap. Um, and uh, we would simply make a 45 degree cut down through here. Um, sometimes it's helpful uh, just to make sure that we're getting things cut in the correct orientation to simply do a, a rough layout mark. Uh, I might just make a line right here. I want to cut uh, that way, and then this part, I want to make a line uh, to make sure that I'm cutting this way. Um, I've seen people cut them backwards. I've probably done it myself. I'm just choosing to block it out. 
but uh, essentially all we really need is a uh, 45 uh, degree uh, angle. Now if you're joining parts together that aren't square, um, that interior uh, angle will obviously uh, change. Um, but for a straight picture frame join, it's going to be uh, at a 45. I want to make sure that that goes all the way to the corner, right to the knife edge, because we're going to assume that this part was the length it is for a reason. And I'm simply going to make a line. Um, when I cut that, I will have to cut down through that corner to make this edge uh, sharp to maintain the original length. The other part needs to be laid out in the same manner. Again, I've already put a a reference line on here for my cut. So I'm going to simply hold this and uh, get that lined up with the corner. And then I'm going to go ahead and make the scribe line. With that having been done, I would then cut these corners off, make sure that I remove the material on the inside to maintain that angle, and then I would button these up. Um, the reason I hate this method of joining is because we have a butt on the top, we have a fillet weld, essentially we will have a fillet weld on the inside, but then we have this sharp outside corner uh, that is difficult to deal with structurally. Um, I will typically grind that corner off uh, to get down near the weld that's on the inside, and then I will replace that corner with a weld bead to get a little more structural strength. But again, if you're using this method of joining, uh, structural strength may not be your top concern uh, in the first place. I would recommend um, other methods. All right, folks, when it comes to cutting your pieces, the uh, sky's the limit. You've got saws, grinders, torches, um, pretty much anything you want to use. So pick your pleasure and let's do some cutting. Okay, we're going to start fitting these pieces together. Uh, I had one piece that was already fit, um, but I made another one that is similar. Uh, the primary difference being that I have a gap uh, created on the top edge. This is going to make this a, uh, a little bit easier to fit and get the orientation the same as the other one, uh, something like this. I've actually purposely created a gap on the top uh, so that it'll be easier to weld uh, on the back side. So when I fit this up, I'm going to need some means of actually uh, keeping it square. Now, I could just use a combination square uh, to check it. It's probably the easiest thing. The purpose of this video is not to circumvent any weld procedure or engineering drawing. It's simply to give you options when you're building something on your own. Small tack on top, and I'm just going to check it for squareness. Uh, if it's out a little bit, which it probably will move, uh, I'll just tap it around until the fit up is fairly tight. I'm going to give it a little love in on this side. Check it. For the purposes of this video, things don't need to be square, but you know I'm going to do my best to try to keep things uh, realistic. 
Um, I will say in advance of this that, you know, the reality is, is that you will uh, almost inevitably uh, find yourself in need of tuning your machine in, uh, you know, to get some of these uh, joint configurations welded correctly. Um, I'm not going to take the time to tune the machine in for this video. I'm just going to run it. Now, the ceramic in this case is going to go on with one side of the tape folded up and I'm going to tuck this in the corner. Um, I'm, it, I'm just using this to help support the weld so I can get a full penetration weld without having to do uh, much, if any, grinding at all. So again, I'm going to press that ceramic tape on and uh, now I have a joint where I can actually weld from here all the way across. So that's the first fit up. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one. Our next fit up was a uh, joint where we, we actually cut these pieces to overlap like this. Now if this was actually going to fit on the outside edge uh, so that the, this outside edge was flush and you wanted full penetration, you'd have to chamfer all of this and uh, again weld the, the bottom side probably first um, and then uh, grind into this and then fill it as a butt. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I'm just going to set this back about a quarter inch so I can get a fill, fillet weld on the inside. I have a little bit of a root opening uh, here on the, on the bottom of the joint, and I've beveled it as well. Uh, that will allow me to fill that. First, okay. I'm going to check this thing to make sure that it's... Uh, you know, reasonably square. That's actually really good right there. So I'm going to give a little tap in the bottom inside corner. And then I'm going to tack the outside edge. But I'm going, to, I'm going to check it once again just to make sure she's fit. And I'd rather have it slightly open than closed because it's going to shrink when I weld it. So again, I'm going to put a tack on here without welding it to the table, preferably And there we have it. The next joints that we fit up were the joints that were fit at 35 degrees. Um, when I cut and prepped these, I actually beveled one on the inside and I beveled one on the outside, just to show you uh, the difference. Again, this is for your own experience. So for the first piece, uh, what I have here is I have this piece beveled on the top edge. Um, that will allow me to, uh, you know, again, use some sort of open root technique or ceramic uh, on the inside. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set this piece up and I'm going to go ahead and fit it. I'm going to fit it upside down so I can tack it. But, you know, basically this is what it's going to look like from the top side right here. Now, it is my intention to make sure that this is actually fit at 35 degrees. So... I'm going to grab my measuring tool and I'm going to make sure that it's lined back up. Ah, lost it. Here we go again, folks. Take two. And I'm going to double check. She still looks good. I'm going to tack down on the inside. I get a little bit of a gap. Uh, again, on this, this uh, fillet well down here, it's difficult to cut away this part. Uh, the radius uh, is really a problem, so you almost always end up with a gap, or at least I do. Um, but that's not a big deal. We'll just increase the weld size by the amount of the gap, and we'll still maintain the strength. And I'm just going to use a couple of light little squirts to fill up. Uh, the, the space and then I'll bridge the gap. Okay, finally I'm going to put one more tack uh, down here because it's another tight spot that will help maintain a line. Okay. Now again I've got a root opening. This was actually beveled uh, from the top. I will probably put uh, ceramic on this. Yeah, let's do that. Let's weld this one uh, with ceramic backing. We could use any form of backing, uh, but because of the, uh, the way the cuts came out, um, this is the one I cut with the plasma. Um, 
not, not easy to get in there with a plasma torch. Um, I've got to get it so close to get the arc initiated that it's hard to maintain the correct angle to begin with. The cutting torch, uh, oxy fuel is a little bit easier. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a piece of ceramic and throw that on this and we'll set it aside for welding. This is basically the, uh, the same joint that we just did. Difference is it's beveled on the inside, okay? So again, I'm just gonna fit this up the same way. Now this one, the gap is relatively tight on the top, so I'm not going to put ceramic on. I'm actually going to tack the end, and then I'm going to uh, fill this and then back grind it. Okay. The next one to fit, I believe the last one to fit, is this picture frame contraption. Um, I really don't like this. I think I said that before. Um, I don't like doing this at all. But I'm doing it just for you, okay? Um, we want to make sure that this is fit at 90 degrees. Um, I don't know what I got for gaps. I'm just beveling stuff quick and dirty. I use like every tool in the shop to make these cuts. Some, some more fun than others, I would say. Uh, so there is a uh, 90 degree fit. And I'm gonna hold that down, set my tool aside, drop my hood, give a little tack into the top. purpose of this is not to demonstrate every manner in which you could weld, but it's to show how to fit these and again, the best method for getting a full penetration weld. So for today, I'll use ceramic. I came from BIW and that's what comes natural to me. Alright, that is ready to go. And we are ready to weld. We're going to start welding up this first uh, part. This is the one that was actually filmed uh, first. I, uh, I attacked this up uh, yesterday, so when I came in, this thing was already uh, put together. But it's beveled on top. It's got a light bevel. It's not very deep. It means that it's going to require some grinding, but the intention was to weld the back side and then grind into it. Um, this was fit without a gap. And this is really to show you how bad this idea is. A little bit of a root opening is good. Uh, the other one that was fit up like it has got a relatively large root opening, uh, so I know I can get 100% penetration. It's, it's actually way bigger than necessary, but again, just to show you that it can, in fact, be done. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna weld this up with flux core. I'm gonna roll it around and weld it uh, in position and we'll uh, try to keep the welding uh, on the camera and we'll uh, see what we can do here. So I'm gonna weld this back side here first. Start on the inside corner. Right now I've got about 22 and a half volts on the machine. Wire feed speed is a little lighter than I want it. I might turn it up when I get to the ceramic, but for the fillet welds it's fine. I'm gonna hit the back side. My intention is to wrap all of the edges. Um, I definitely need a little more wire feed. I don't normally wrap flux core. I wasn't trained that way. Uh, there's definitely a time and a place for it. 
Um, I generally run with my angle about 90 degrees to the park. Uh, if I need a little bit uh, more fill or penetration, I will drag it slightly. Um, but generally speaking, I like a 90 degree part and I like to see where I'm going, not where I've been. Um, on these butts, I will drag it because I want more penetration. So I'm gonna weld this up after I grind this out. Um, again, I've got a fillet weld on the back and I'm gonna have to grind into this to get a full penetration weld. Alright, so right there I've dug down in, I'm into the fillet well below, I've got the ability now to make a full penetration well. Again, the intention here is to get a full penetration well, so I am going to, I'm going to drag. I want a little more penetration. I want a little bit of fill. Second pass. I do not want to uh, have excessive reinforcement, so I'm going to uh, do a little bit of, I'm going to give a little squirt right on this corner to make sure it's fully back, and I'm going to weld across with a push. It's going to be largely uh, the same thing. Uh, if we have a groove uh, that is uh, tight, we're going to have to grind it out. I want full penetration. So what I have here is I have a weld joint that is as strong as the original, as strong as the original uh, angle bar was. Okay. The only difference between part one and part two is the gap. Okay. So this piece I'm going to weld in a manner that is similar. I'm going to stand this up. I'm going to weld this corner first. So here we go. Now I stopped slightly short of the top because I need to fill that top piece uh, with ceramic. And I'm actually going to do that next. Um, this piece will be filled up. Uh, let me clear this off. This piece will be filled up from the outside in. Again, I'm going to just tack it first to bridge the gap. And I'm going to try to keep that puddle orange so any slag that's in there doesn't get trapped within the weld.
All right, the intention there is to weld on the leading edge of the puddle, so I'm kind of welding on the ceramic. Uh, when I get to the inside corner, I'm actually welding on the vertical wall of the angle, so it's not, uh, I'm not really welding to the ceramic at that point. knock the tape off and you can see here that I have weld all the way through. There's no need to grind this. I'll just put a fillet weld on the back side. I'm going to touch up the corner. Again, if you're ever doing little squirts like that, you want to make sure that you keep the part nice and orange so the slag has a chance to uh, remelt. And now I'm going to fill this thing up. I'm actually going to start from the inside corner and I'm going to work backwards. stop a little bit short of the end only because uh, it was filled more at one end than the other so I'm just trying to even it up and now what I'll do is I'll put two cover passes on uh, because it was so wide and that was basically my fault I just didn't choose to make another one Pass number two. All right, folks, so this is being done in real time. Um, you know, just working my way through. If stuff gets hot, it gets hot. Uh, I'm going to do the best I can to. Uh, do this if I was welding this for real. Uh, inside now, can we weld it up? A good shot of that, hopefully, on the uh, overhead uh, camera. Um, I've got uh, still some color there, so I'm going to go ahead and weld this joint, and then I'll come up around. I'm not going to weld that and then do the vertical like I did before, because the part is just, uh, it's just too hard. If I can't get this so it's uh, within view of the camera. A little harder than it looks, actually. How about that? I'm going to turn around and go the other way because. I anticipate some arc flow, so I'm going the opposite direction. Now that's a full penetration well. There's no need to put another pass on the bottom to cover that up. That's as strong as the angle bar is. I'm just going to put a reinforcing fillet on the inside. Part number two, all welded up. All right, folks, we're going to go handheld to finish this thing up. Uh, again, I'm pretty disappointed to find out just a few minutes ago that my overhead camera was not actually filming. The close-up weld footage was there, um, but uh, it is what it is, I guess. Um, there's not much I can do about it. Um, what we've got here, uh, kind of for a final view, 
are our, our regular straight angle joins. Again, these were full penetration welded. Uh, we made sure that we beveled these and or left a root opening. This one was welded again uh, with ceramic and we have that telltale ceramic look on the outside. Uh, as I said before while we were filming, it's not uh, super pretty, but it's way better than back gouging 40 some odd feet of uh, side shell seam at the shipyard. So we've got the final one that we did, again, just to kind of go back at the actual angle joins, um, or the non-straight joins, I should say. This was the picture frame. Again, ceramic was used here. You don't have to, you know, V them out and uh, get 100% well. That's uh, entirely up to you. Not everyone has ceramic. But again, the outside corner I ground into uh, just to make sure that I had a good solid join. Um, this right here was, again, uh, an inside corner join. You can see how this looks all welded. We've got the butt, the inside fillets all tied together. And then again, from the outside, I've got the uh, cat pass. And I chose to left this, uh, I chose to leave this with an overhang so that uh, I wouldn't have to bevel and uh, make the ends 100%. These two uh, assemblies right here were the uh, first two that we did, just a basic join. This was welded again with ceramic. Uh, so I've got the fillet weld that's covering up. Uh, you can still see part of the ceramic weld in there. It was 100% all the way through, so there's no need to completely cap it. But it did leave a wide root opening, and that's why we have two cover passes. This joint right here, we simply beat out, and I put in a couple of layers of weld, but there's only one cap. But again, other than that, it's the same exact joint. Moving on, we've got the, uh, the 35 degree twins here. Uh, this was welded with a very large root opening in ceramic. Again, it's 100% weld if you don't like the look of ceramic. Um, I've never been a particularly good fan of it with flux core. It does tend to uh, have its own weird lumpiness to it. But, uh, you know, again, you can see that it's uh, welded up 100% all the way around. And this one is exactly the same. The only difference being is we uh, V'd this out from the inside originally so that we would grind out the outside and leave a narrower pass. That's typically what you would do uh, as a welder, you know, without access to ceramic backing. Um, again, you could use almost anything for backing material. I would avoid using a permanent backing bar. Um, you know, they're easy to weld to, but I think they just look like crap. So that's it, folks. Um, we'll see what we do next. Have a great one. Bye-bye.